Hello, this is Talking Europe. I'm Catherine Nicholson, joined today down the line from Berlin by Franziska Brandner, who's Parliamentary State Secretary at the German Economy and Climate Ministry and also a Green Party member of the German Parliament. Now, Germany much in focus this week as lawmakers in the Bundestag overwhelmingly backed a decision to send heavier weapons to Ukraine. Eyes on Berlin too, as Russia cut off gas supplies to two other EU countries, Poland and Bulgaria, while Germany remains heavily reliant on Russian gas imports, more so than the EU average. Franziska Brandner, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. I'd like to start off um, by talking about something that happened at the end of this week, just briefly. Russian missiles striking Kiev during the visit of the head of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. Uh, what do you read into this? Is this an attempt by Vladimir Putin to intimidate the international community? It is a clear sign of disrespect for the United Nations, for the global institution that still holds us all together. But it's, of course, also yet another attack on a civilian town. And uh, it just shows that Vladimir Putin is not inclined to please anywhere, anybody, but just really to go ahead with brutal force. Let's move on by talking about uh, that issue I raised uh, in my introduction on Thursday, the German parliament voting overwhelmingly uh, to back more heavy arms, shipments and financial support for Ukraine from Germany. Uh, this uh, sending of weapons in general is a big step for Germany and particularly your party, the Greens, which have traditionally held strong pacifist stances. Has it taken a lot of soul searching to take this step? It is a very clear case for us, the Greens, that we do support Ukraine. Ukraine right now defends the liberty and democracy and freedom of uh, Europe, and it also defends us. And I think that the right to self-defense is so clearly also enshrined in the United Nations Charter that it is our obligation almost to help, but it's also in our own interest. Um, and I do not think that we have been soul searching because you mentioned the pacifist party. That was maybe the case until 1990, in the 1990s when uh, the German government took already decisions uh, to participate under green leadership uh, in a mission at a time to fight back uh, mm. the Milosevic, etc. regime. And we have evolved since. But yes, we maintain a skepticism towards military intervention, which I think is also good that we mm. do not easily go into military conflicts. Mm. Now, there has been quite a quick response from uh, Russia to this vote in the German parliament. Uh, Russia's former president, now deputy chairman of the National Security Council, Dmitry Medvedev, he said on his Telegram channel, uh, he, he made a comparison by this vote to Nazi Germany. He said, this is sad for the German parliament. It will end sadly. Do you take this as a threat to Germany from the Kremlin? There are many attempts to threaten now Germany also to manipulate our own uh, <laughs> our own German, of course, public discourse. Uh, and I think that's uh, what we're also in. It's a war also about information, about interpretation. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to push it back and say clearly what this is about. Uh, and we are no way going in the direction of Nazi Germany. On the contrary, we're defending the Ukrainians' citizens' will to remain a free country. Uh, the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, has warned the West in general, not just Germany, uh, about the risk of nuclear attack. He said this risk is real. Um, does the German government take this as a credible threat? Do you think Russia could take this step? We do, of course, know that uh, this is a situation that is a delicate and a difficult one and that Russia does have nuclear power. And we are not naive. We are not a risk overtaker, uh, but we are in a situation where we weigh together with our partners' options very seriously. And I think it's important for 
us as Germans that we really do this in consultation with the British, with the French, the Americans, NATO, the European Union, Japan, a broader alliance. Uh, and I think that's the way forward that we show unity and uh, do go step by step, take mm. the necessary decisions uh, to help Ukraine. Uh, let's focus in on the energy issue now, Francisca Brandner. Russia this week, as I said, cut off gas supplies to Poland, to Bulgaria, over their insistence that they will not pay for their fuel in rubles. Now, Russia has uh, now uh, refused a payment for gas in euros from a German utilities company that was uh, confirmed overnight from Thursday to Friday. Is Germany's gas supply secure at this point? We have inherited as a government a terrible dependence on Russian energy, also not just on the energy flowing, but on the pipelines, the infrastructure, uh, the ref refineries when it comes to oil. And we are going day by day the way out of this dependency. It's a painful a moment to realize that our capacity to act is limited by this dependency, but we do everything really that is possible to us to get out of this as quick as we can. And yes, we do have a situation um, where right now we can, of course, serve all the energy needs. But if we get a gas stop tomorrow, we might have some problems in the fall and in the winter. Mm -hmm. uh, and the more we save now, the more reduced the problems will be in the fall and the winter. But it would be really wrong to say that it would be anything close to easy for Germany. Mm. Now, uh, Bloomberg has reported that 10 EU member countries have actually set up ruble bank accounts to enable them to potentially pay for their gas in rubles. Uh, is, is Germany among those 10? We have very clearly said that we continue or our companies continue paying in euros or dollars what the treaty or the agreement they have um, also says. So we are uh, sticking to that line. We are sticking to the, out, the direction that the European Commission has been giving. Um, so we think it's important that the EU remains united behind the interpretation of the mm. European Commission, mm. and that's our guidance. Uh, could it be an option for Germany to continue nuclear power production instead of shutting down the three remaining nuclear power plants by the end of this year as planned, given these unprecedented emergency circumstances? The thing is that uh, keeping the nuclear plants run longer uh, wouldn't help us with the gas situation because the gas is used in Germany for heating and in the indus industry sector, which is not served by nuclear power plants energy. So unfortunately, that's not an option. Um, we have also checked very much and very thoroughly um, this case, if it would really make a difference, and the answer is no. So that's why we have gone the route of uh, buying LNG terminals, setting them up, getting contracts uh, with other countries that diversify uh, the, the sources, and also that we are really speeding up the process of building renewable energy across Europe, which has been very slow in the past. So also there, we're really speeding the process up. So just to be clear, Germany is sticking to its deadline for ending its nuclear power production. Yes, there is no case for extending it. OK, Francisca Brandner, unfortunately, that is all we have time for. But thank you so much for being our guest here on Talking Europe this week. Thank you. Now, just before we close off the programme, uh, we want to bring you some news from how uh, the humanitarian side of the war is being dealt with uh, elsewhere around the European continent. As you know, Russia invaded Ukraine just over two months ago. Since then, uh, more than five million Ukrainians have fled the country, with nearly 45,000 finding refuge here in France. Now, many of them arrived via Germany and the Garde de l'Est in Paris. The Red Cross receives them on arrival, and there are many Russian volunteers among their number. Jonathan Walsh reports with Vedi Kabal. A train from Germany is pulling into the platform, and these Red Cross volunteers are on the lookout. Hundreds of Ukrainian refugees pass through Paris's Gare de l'Est daily, mainly women and children. 
Masha fled the bombardments in Kharkiv. I hope all this will stop and that we can soon return to Ukraine. I just want to wait a little while to regain my strength, so I'm ready to participate in rebuilding the country. For the refugees welcomed here, there's a surprising twist. Many Russian volunteers come to lend a hand to the Red Cross, which lacks translators to assist and guide the new arrivals. Anna is from St. Petersburg and has been living in France a long time. She knows Ukraine well as she often traveled there with her parents. To be honest, when the war started, I cried for two weeks straight. What totally devastated me in the beginning was that these cities being bombed, being destroyed and looted are in fact the cities of my childhood. I felt I had to do something. With a few rare exceptions, the presence of the Russian interpreters is well accepted by the refugees. I don't mind at all. We don't make a difference between Russians and others. Here we were helped, we suffered no discrimination, everything is fine. The European Union has set up a temporary protection status for Ukrainians, allowing them to reside and work in EU member states for a year. For Anna, she intends to help as long as necessary and as long as she can. I'm a woman of action. I'm used to taking action. And when there's a problem, I'm used to doing everything to solve it. Here I can't solve it, but I can help a little. Many Russians living in France share Anna's distress and publicly denounce the war, which is a freedom of speech unthinkable back in Russia, where the simple use of the word war can lead to prison. Well, that's it for this part of the programme. Do stay with us, though. In part two of Talking Europe, we'll be at the European Parliament in Brussels, meeting a German and Italian lawmaker from the political groups of Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen, chewing over the French presidential election and what the result means for Europe. Do stay with us. See you there in part two.